Okay, looks like we're recording. Thank you. Okay. Okay, she hit record, looks like it's recording, right? So Perfect, yeah, because for some reason it's not going through on this end. I can't even go through and ask. No worries. All right. Looks like we're on business, all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, I'll be next door. Yeah, All right, I'll let you, I'll let you, in this area. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. I'm Megan? Oh, yes, Megan. Exactly. Nice to meet you. Uh, no one's uh, unplugged the presentation laptop since I was right so that's what they did maybe a free back up to the video and then just like stop sharing this and plug the link in so that's what messed up was Well, and Kira and Kato, uh, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Margot Parks, uh, and I'm delighted to have this chance uh, today to convene and participate in this exciting panel. Um, I understand that we have uh, the possibility of people listening remotely or people listening in the future. So we'll reach out across time and space. <laughs> and uh, thanks for your engagement as well. We hope that you find this as um, as fun and interesting as it has been for me pulling this together. Uh, so this session has a very clear combined focus. Uh, there was a real interest in the Planetary Health Alliance team to have a session on communities and justice. Uh, and when they asked me to convene it, I said, I would really love to make a very clear link to, eco to ecosystems and living systems. Uh, and to make sure that we, although we've got the social justice imperative, that we're making those deep connections uh, with the living system. So you're going to see that threaded through today. Um, and I'm really so pleased to be able to introduce our, our guests shortly. Uh, but the flow of the day, um, as you can see, we're a diverse international group and we're going to be visually depicting that as we go along as well. Um, we're going to obviously um, to, to begin, uh, it's important, we're really going to be landing in places. Um, and so today, it's really important that we acknowledge the traditional territory of the Makiwak of, of the Oni tribe, um, that we are thinking about and taking a moment um, to land in this place um, as we go on this planetary journey. <laughs> um, and you will have the, the, um, the fun of actually connecting with a number of different parts of the world and there are um, the way this world, this work is unfolding. And we're going to have three rounds of questions. So none of us are doing a long presentation, but really in a more conversational kind of interview format style. Uh, and uh, I wanted to, and you, we're going to keep moving around um, in the, um, around the planet as you'll see. So um, this will be part of our dynamic is actually placing our stories in the parts of the world and the regions where we live hearing from those different nuanced connections um, and, and pulling this together, um, part of what we're doing is introducing ourselves. So I mentioned that my name is Margot Parks. I welcomed you with a kia ora koutou. Um, I grew up on the east coast of the South Island of New Zealand and you'll see that Google map image there of Timaru is the place I grew up in. That's in Naitahu territory. Um, but I've been fortunate to live over the I've gone too far. Thanks. I'm not, I don't live in the alley. <laughs> um, so I grew up in, uh, in Timaru and um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I've had the privilege to work, live and work around the world, but with a real orientation uh, to the Pacific and America. I lived in Hawaii. Um, so you'll see Hawaii on those maps. And I, these days, um, I'm at the University of Northern British Columbia in the northern part of uh, British Columbia in Canada, a vast northern landscape that has taught me a lot, as you'll hear about. And I want to acknowledge, that was why I had the slide, um, that we have a colleague uh, who was very important in bringing this uh, little event together, Fabian Mendez, 
who hosted the EcoHealth 2018 conference in Cali, Colombia last year with a very, very clear equity and justice theme around environmental issues, particularly as Colombia emerged out of the, is in, is in the peace process, emerging out of a time of war with active struggles and pain um, that is deeply connected to the social injustices, but also the ecological injustices. So we were really fortunate to um, be learning about those issues with Fabian. Fabian wanted to be here with us, um, and I wanted to acknowledge his contribution in um, kind of pulling this, uh, this whole thing together. But instead, um, uh, although Fabian can't be with us, although his face will appear a few times, um, we have this wonderful array of colleagues. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, this theme, the themes of the uh, conversation, communities, justice, um, health, living systems, we've all crossed boundaries as we do this work. So I'm really pleased to have um, with us, on, uh, just as you, you'll hear a little bit more about each of our speakers, um, but we acknowledge that we've all come from different places. So Sandy, who you heard from yesterday, um, has come, emerged in particularly in the justice space and is really active in pursuing that, um, but is also gonna be telling us a little bit about those connections with health and living systems. And Moses, uh, who's from Durban, South Africa, um, Sandy's from San Diego, as you'll see in future slides. Uh, Moses, um, who's currently uh, working, living and working in Durban, South Africa, um, has come in uh, particularly from the ecosystems and the living systems space and moved into the health and justice world. Um, you were lucky to hear from Emanuela, um, who was fueled by her anger and her love, <laughs> as we heard yesterday. Um, and that that's come from a, a, a sense of injustice, but driving those deep connections with what the forests and the living systems that we heard a little bit about in Kalimantan. And then I've uh, recently been pleased to meet and um, be learning about the work that Rachel Demi, who comes very much from the health space um, as a medical doctor like myself, uh, moving in and collaborating with others uh, to understand the living systems and the justice work that we need to, to be attentive to. So a fabulous panel from around the world, as you can see, and I really want you to enjoy um, the sense of moving around this planet we call home um, as we go through this talk and using your imagination to think and make connections with the places that you call home um, and the, the work that you're doing and the, the living systems and those justices or injustices that are driving your work. So with that, um, our first question, uh, what, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to do three rounds of questions. And our first question uh, is focused on communities. Uh, and the question is to ask our panelists to introduce the communities that they work with and how they have inspired or challenged um, their idea of justice or health. So I'll hand over to um, Rachel to start us and we're going to literally move around the planet. So we're beginning in Fiji. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Wanda. Hi, everybody, I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm from Fiji, Sampula, and it's glad to be here. So I basically work on a deep end kind of project called Wish Fiji. Wish basically means watershed interventions for systems health. And uh, we are, uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's Wish Fiji, watershed. And we're basically securing health and through strengthening health systems and integrated water management to tackle three plagues, leptospirosis, dengue fever, and typhoid. And uh, in PG, I'm not going to go into details in the sense of each individual communities because there's so many and uh, probably we're going to remember their names by the end of the session, but uh, Fiji is divided into two major islands and out of all which at least working in uh, uh, two of them, three of the two of them, and if you were to look at it, we've got uh, five catchments um, and we're working in the watersheds. I'll share a photo of straight after this. But we've got five catchments and we're working in, the, this is the main island, Fiji, Viti Levu. We're working in this particular upper Nambora River, subject catchment area. And we've got two catchments from this area. Uh, it's called Korobo. And um, we've got a catchment in the eastern side of Fiji. This, um, these two basically represent the central um, part of Fiji and overall here we're working in a catchment there called Puerta and uh, that's um, on the eastern side 
and we've got the North Island, the second largest island in Fiji, and we've got one subcatchment left there. So basically, the way we're working with this research project, um, it's um, using a watershed system. Basically, um, we're using the upstream, downstream, and we've got a number of collaborators work in this, and we're not just um, working uh, by saying downstream, we're even looking at the um, reefs that we're possibly going to be counting fishes, like the numbers of fishes, and what, what happens upstream, what's happening in the environment, what's uh, the agricultural component, the, um, the communities, etc. that I'll be talking a lot more about later on, where we're basically using uh, the watersheds as a unit to uh, see how these impact health within these communities along that. So every catchment selected, we've got villages or communities, if you want to say, that line are along that river basin, like that river that runs through from right from the source down to the bottom. And there's certain community, certain catchments which we're going to assess, review is, um, and which have um, uh, runoffs into uh, the uh, into the sea and assessing how the reef, the base, uh, it affects the reef systems. And in that, obviously, we're um, looking into um, quite a number of things, but our main focus there is lactotype work in the, in the Enki. And uh, this is basically, we've just started, we're a three year project, and we've just started with um, uh, our baseline, and we're, um, we're finished with one catchment. Um, and uh, it's been, uh, this is just our team in the field doing a mapping exercise with the villages. And uh, yeah, and we've already, just having started, we've already been finding some significant uh, uh, opportunities to work with to help improve just how we can best intervene in these watershed systems. So that's basically Bish Fiji, and um, yeah, thanks for that. So we'll hand over now. <laughs> right. Um, I just want to greet everyone with one short song from my tribe. Erang hila aku mani yang lega, ruwe makis ku alungai natu lelu. Daya erang hila aku mudres tanpa bn. Bangga tatu leu, kuai nuku lagi semangke, kuai nuku lagi semangke. So, thank you for coming to this um, panel, this discussion. And my name is Emmanuel Shinta. I'm coming from Borneo, uh, Kalimantan, which is the part of Borneo that belongs to Indonesia. That's a very rich island, a lot of biodiversity and natural resources. And of course, also very beautiful cultures like my tribe, Dayak people, the original people of the land. We consist of 400 different sub-tribes and speak 400 different languages. And I'm so glad to be here to represent uh, my communities. Actually, I have an organization as well, which is called Rano Welum Foundation, which I founded in 2016 as the response to the forest fires that happened in, in Kalimantan. Um, but I will be uh, more glad uh, to represent my communities rather than my own organizations. And I just want to show you very short videos because I want you to experience and see what it feels like in Kalimantan. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the introduction of my community. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm from Zimbabwe, but I'm currently working in uh, South Africa. In my 29 years of research career, I've had a chance to work in many Southern African countries, but I decided for this presentation to just focus on uh, one community that I'm currently working in. So um, I'm working in a community that is called Ingwavuma community, and it's unique in the sense that it's just on the border of South Africa and uh, Swaziland and Mozambique. Uh, it's unique in the sense that these countries don't have uh, the same uh, kind of economies. If we take, for instance, disease control for malaria, there's a strong program in South Africa and we are about to eliminate malaria, but the same is not, it's not the same in Swaziland and Mozambique. So we have challenges of uh, cross-border infections. So I would like to, 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 to start right there. So my, my, my community is a very poor community. Uh, we're looking at people uh, who are living on probably just like 50 US dollars uh, per the whole month as families. Uh, this is uh, a place where you've got multi-cultures, as I've already indicated, Swaziland. Uh, Mozambique and South Africa. Uh, and in this place here, it's unique also in the sense that you have uh, two strong political parties that are residing in there. That is the ruling party, the ANC, uh, and uh, the Inkata Freedom Party. So the politics of development is at play in that, in that sense, because uh, then the area may not be fully developed if the opposition is uh, in the lead. Uh, but there are also challenges uh, of climate variability and climate change in that area. I didn't have uh, a chance. Okay, I didn't have a chance to actually show you uh, how it has been changing over time. But what I want to show you, which inspires me to work in these communities, I want you to look at the left and the right. Uh, so you have got a modern house there. So I haven't taken, you know, a, 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 an upmarket family. They are about the same. Look at the disparity between the two habitations. Uh, you look at the next one. Uh, these are the same kids. So some of the kids uh, on my left there, this is a crash uh, with an appropriate facility for, for toilets. And look at the other one. Uh, it's so you know, that, that pit toilet is a real pit toilet. I took the picture myself and we've had chances of children falling in there. Uh, if you look at that road that passes through my community there uh, from a big network of roads in Deben, uh, but this is what we experience uh, on the other part of the world. So actually this is what really inspires me to, to work in this community that they are marginalized communities and I would like to make a difference to them. All right, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to introduce the communities that we work in at Mothers Out Front. So Mothers Out Front, we are <clears throat> a national organization. We were founded in Boston and we have teams all across the country. So in California, we do have active teams and we have active teams in San Francisco, San Jose, uh, Sacramento and San Diego and Fresno. And so <clears throat> I wanna show you the faces of our teams. So starting from your left, you have San Francisco, you have um, San Diego, San Jose, Woodland, which is the capital region team of Sacramento. <clears throat> and then the next slide is uh, Fresno. So these communities are all different. So we have um, some of the teams are in marginalized communities. We have some teams in affluent neighborhoods, but all the common um, cause together is that we're moms that care about climate. And so um, concern for their children, concern for their future, and concern of their health. So we do have moms that um, have 
were victims of the Paradise Fire here in California. So a lot of them were uh, refugees and had to move to different neighborhoods. Um, we have uh, moms in the Fresno area because that's where all the oil extraction is happening. So we have high uh, moms with children with high asthma. And so in some areas um, in neighborhoods that we work in, there's um, a threat of their open space. And so there's proposal of development and a threat to having um, an open space where kids can have access to trees. So pretty much what we're doing on the ground locally is that we're trying to get our cities to be responsible for climate and making sure that we have plans that protect not just our children's health, but our future as well. And then do I ask you the next question? <laughs> ask me this question. <laughs> We were joking because uh, when Fabian was going to join me as a as a co-host, we were going to ask each other the questions. So uh, San Sandy's handing the mic over to me um, in that I, um, I'm really excited also to uh, what we hope you're experiencing is the zooming in to the specifics of particular communities who are experiencing the connections between communities and justice and living systems um, in different parts of the world. And these are some of the communities uh, that, um, have, that I've been fortunate to work with over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, and one of the themes, I, the theme I wanted to bring out here about what inspires me with working with some of these groups of people um, is that there, they are, <clears throat> a lot of the work is based in particular communities and particular identifiable towns or villages or watersheds or municipalities, but there's also communities of people who are coming together across sectoral and disciplinary and cultural boundaries to <clears throat> do the necessary learning. And the big themes that emerge out of this work for me that I was trying to kind of get to the gist of it, but in terms of justice, there's this sense of intergenerational equity that really inspires people. And that's coming through more and more strongly with the work. The, the, I do a lot of work with health authorities and watershed organizations and others who are trying to understand the health and well-being implications of land and water governance. Those communities that I work with want increasingly to connect with youth and feel and recognize that youth, that, that the next generation is uh, needing and hungry to be connecting in a new way. So I'll talk a little bit about the intergenerational equity theme again. But there's also moving to Canada, um, as somebody that grew up in New Zealand uh, and had a very strong uh, sort of personal lifestyle connection with nature um, and that that really drove my decision to move from working as a, a medical doctor and, and to the, literally the system expanded. This was the system I was looking at, the human system, and it expanded into communities and then into watersheds. Um, and in doing that, if we understand the other species, so not just the intergenerational equity here, but there is an interspecies story that is unfolding and often left unsaid in a lot of our work that these other species with whom we're fortunate enough to share the planet with are part of those that are bearing the brunt of changes to ecosystems and living systems in the places that we're living. So the interspecies theme is captured in First Nations cultures that I've been very privileged to work with um, in the sense of all our relations. Um, and all our relations being the winged ones, being the finned ones, being the legged ones, being, and, and that as we start to understand any of the issues that we're looking at in relation to the other species that are also experiencing these challenges, we gain a new understanding and a, and a deeper sense of the connectedness that needs to drive this work. And often drives from a research point of view, the kinds of questions that we might work with with the communities and in, in responding to where some of their concerns and interests are. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to this image on the right hand side here and I, I, it just really struck me how relevant it was to this community. This was in New Brunswick uh, with a, I'm part of a large inter, a national and international network, the Environment Community Health Observatory Network that I co-lead. And we have a, a group in New Brunswick and we're standing here looking at a new mur mural on the New Brunswick campus that's honoring the indigenous knowledges of the Mi'kmaq people. And I just really love the image here, the humble kind of looking up, which was really the posture of what, we're trying, what a lot of us are needing to do to really be connecting with that intergenerational theme and the all our relations theme. There's a bunch of really smart people at the bottom of that photo, but there is a lot to learn from, from the past standing tall over us. Um, so those are um, 
And in this next image, um, as you'll see in my future slides, the idea here is that um, introductions and for Māori are often connecting people to their mountain, to their river, sometimes to their wind. Um, and so uh, this is an image of the mountain that is, um, I would say that um, Auraki te maunga, maunga. Is, Auraki is my mountain, the tallest mountain in New Zealand. Um, and that the notion of whakapapa, the connection of genealogical lineage is connecting socially and to places. Um, and so images um, of, of people that I have been learning that with in New Zealand. So now we hand this back um, and we come around to um, the next slide. I'll actually get you to click that one. Uh, Rachel, and the next next series of questions that we're going to ask um, are about asking each of our panelists to talk about the living systems in some detail that have been inspiring the work that they do and the particular unique relationships that some of the communities have with those living systems. So Rachel, we'll start with you. Do you need the microphone? Yes, I've got, we've got like, I've got two. <laughs> Thanks, Margot. Um, yeah, there's one thing I forgot to mention <clears throat> earlier on was what, the communities we work in is rural. And uh, when we talk about living systems, the Fijians back home are very closely knit to the land that surrounds them like you would expect. I've seen that commonly in New Zealand, in New Zealand as well. And probably in a lot of places like I mean, we've just been hearing. So basically, if you, talk, if you talk about the living systems that these communities are surrounded by, it's, it, that's what makes them. It, what, that's what makes them. And uh, without them, they, one, one of the things I'd say is they're vulnerable. Um, well, you could see this beautiful sunset. This is one of uh, the things you'd see just that, like exiting one of our catchments, like part of the catchment that goes into the river. But when you look at this, this is one of our communities back uh, from the catchment we've selected. They're surrounded by agriculture. They have a river passing by through them. They, um, there's a lot that's happening. That's the rivers that pass through them. They're beautiful, but they're being affected. Now, vulnerability kicks in. This is the first picture on, the, on my right, your left, would be just a day, this is just two days ago before, we, before the conference started. And we're at this community and it's inaccessible on day one because it's just rained slightly and you're unable to access. You need to cross that river to get to the community, get to the village. And um, just on the other, uh, just the next pitch on the right, um, you see that it's cleared out. The sun's gone, the rain's like uh, stopped, and then the water levels go down, it's accessible. And this is one of the vulnerabilities that it brings about, is just one of the accessibilities to it. And well, apart from that, this is, um, the, uh, and the community uh, picture I showed earlier, is, I would relate that to this. Um, the understanding of how communities is set up is so important. And this is something that a lot of communities, a lot of villages don't not, do not have an understanding of. And these are latrines, which, is, which are draining into the water system. And this is their water source. This is what they live on. This is what they bathe in. This is what they probably drink of. And uh, this is affecting them. And this is so such simple if you look at it it's not complicated it's not rocket science that you got to do something so huge to make a difference so we're going and looking into this and like this is the obvious things we find immediately like just runoffs from the latrines into the river systems and it's um it's um honestly for us it's probably something that's like oh we should have done it. we should have done it that way but obviously these people are not knowledgeable about it so that makes a difference in their living systems that's surrounding them and um, one of the biggest things uh, we've seen from one of our, uh, the catchments we've just finished back home is, um, is this, it's, um, it's, uh, it's dredging, uh, the quarries. Quarries, um, in this one particular catchment, we've got um, in the Fijian system, the Fijians own the land. And obviously within that, there is a particular tribe or a clan that will own majority of the land or that will allow, okay, yeah, okay, you guys will sign a contract with you guys and you guys can go ahead and build a quarry and take all the gravel and extract it. And, but what's affecting them is, this is what's happened. It's gone all muggy and it's like, it's dirty. You're, you don't have this, the food that you need, the villages would have needed in that system anymore. It's all gone. 
it's not livable for any of these animals, these sea, um, these river animals to survive in. They've lost a source of, of their food source. We heard about uh, nutrition earlier in the morning, the food supply chain that's happening. This is a real, like an example of what's happening out there in this particular catchment that we're working on. In. And um, it's not just a source of food supply for them, but sometimes for them, this is their source of income and uh, what's going around them. And uh, because of this, the rivers have gone wider, shallower, like there's, like nothing stays. It dries up in no time. So there's lots happening. And this is just a few things um, just from the living system, the agricultural component, the river systems, and just the whole community, how they set up. And we've, uh, one of the important things we've noticed is that because of these dredging issues, um, sorry, these quarry extractions, the villages have had to be, like they've been displaced. They've had to move higher. And literally that takes them away from the land that they own um, and um, to a place where they probably have not much land to plant on anymore. So that definitely reduces agricultural components. Um, because one of the things with rural communities in Fiji is their main source of income if they're um, not educated is basically agriculture or the sea or the river that surrounds you. That's it. That's about it. Or they probably do something that's pretty simple that's around. But otherwise, that's the main thing. So this is basically the river systems. I mean, the systems and living systems that's been affecting our catchments. And obviously, watch the space. You'll hear a lot more about Wish Fiji in the near future. Yeah, well, when we talk about the indigenous communities, I'm not sure if you ever heard about this, but 80% of the rainforest in the world is the place where indigenous community live. And that's also a um, similar thing like in Kalimantan, in Borneo, uh, Daya communities live really depend on the forest and with the forest because for us forest it's more than sources it's more than a place where we get our livelihood but it's a part of our identity that's the place where we uh, do the ritual traditions and um, all those things like you know it's the connections with the ancestors so when we lost the forest we are not only losing the livelihood or sources but we lose our identity so that's why forest is play uh, playing very important roles for the communities and you know like um a week before i came i fly to uh, california i visited my uh, home village that's uh, my home village you see it's a very small village and surrounded uh, by forests and I talked to this uh, grandma, like she's already like 100, over 100 years old. And, and she told me a lot of stories. She told me all these memories that she had with my grandmothers and grandfathers that already passed away. And it's really touching for me. And I asked also, oh, what is your recipe? So you can have this is really long life, you know, like you're, you're old and you're still very healthy and remember all these things. And she shares a lot about these uh, traditional medicines and also about the foods and how actually in the past, they used to uh, fish in the lake and just get all these things not from the market but from the forest and and that's very essential for dire communities you know and the problem now is uh, Kalimantan experience what I call really the hell you know of environmental destructions because all this extractive industries come to our places and take over everything um, lodging all the rainforests in the past 20 years have been cut down. Like the 50% of the rainforest is gone in the past 20 years. And also we have this problem with mining, like coal mining and gold minings. People suffer and like the, the pictures of the river that you showed, that's exactly the same it's like what happened in my place. It's so polluted. And like you see now on the slides and yesterday I talked also about this, the forest fires that already happened since 1997. And could you imagine how how big is the areas that are already being burned? How 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 much the rainforest that already destroyed because of this clearing of the land because of the palm oil plantations? So um, you know, like 
this living systems actually for me it's it's not only interesting but that's essential that's very crucial and that's how also we take actions actually like five minutes 10 minutes it's not enough for me to talk about diet communities you know like i'm talking about my own family <laughs> there's a lot that i want to share but uh, yeah um just briefly we have a lot of treasures there but now it's under threat yeah and that's what me and my fellow brothers and sisters trying to work on um, with our youth act campaigns and run Wellum foundations that I founded in 2016. So uh, the first things uh, we believe in the power of youth and we believe in the power of media because due to the political reasons, uh, like all these big, you know, giant companies become our enemies. We have a lot of difficulties to tell about the truth from the ground. So uh, we. We, we make these foundations and communities um, to address all the issues through videos and films. So uh, it's on our website. You can come to me after this if you want to find out more about what's happening in Kalimantan. But that's what we do. We move young people and uh, the communities, the leaders, um, all these policymakers, media, especially international attentions. We want to get the international attentions because it's very hard for us to speak about our issues uh, in the local and national level. So that's what we do. And um, yeah, there's so much work to be done, but I'm so proud to be at Dayak and I'm so proud to be able to tell you about uh, my homeland and my people. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> I just want to show you uh, a slide that will um, uh, give us more information about this community that um, I'm working in, which I said is in Guavuma community before I go to the last slide. Um, okay, can you go back? Yeah, go back. Right, leave it there. Okay, so. I, I just wanted to, to show you that this community is involved in a lot of uh, avoidance, a lot of uh, being compromised, a lot of uh, competing uh, with uh, um, many other aspects there. So if you look at that slide there, it's, it's, it's showing you that uh, this community relies actually on cattle because I already said that it's a dry area. So cattle and goats are the most important things in their community. Uh, and small gardens because really there's no there's no rain there uh, but you can also see that uh, there's that traditional dancing is to try and uh, please some people that i'll talk about later so that other slide that you see it's land that has been invaded by an invasive species uh, which is now called actually uh, famine weed uh, and on the other side you can see while we all want to come and see the elephants they can be very destructive. The elephants also sometimes get into the community. So there's a lot of uh, uh, human and wildlife conflict there. Uh, and you see on the other side, you've got tourism that is thriving. And yet these people in that community are very poor. So that's what I wanted to just show you. Um, and yeah. Now, while she's looking for that slide, I thought just as I did to choose one community, I also want to just choose one case study that will illustrate uh, how we interact with the living systems. Yes, there we go. Go back. Here. Go back. Go back. Right. I think. All right. So the, the, this is the plant that you saw earlier on, uh, which is called Pathinium. Uh, and it can take over the agricultural land completely. Uh, so um, this is something that I'm interested in is because it, it clearly demonstrates the linkages between health and the environment and uh, animals there. So you can see it affects uh, the human skin, it affects uh, the goat, it affects wildlife and it takes over the land for agriculture. So it's a real serious problem. Uh, but what we, we believe in is that uh, we can only tackle this problem if we work together. Uh, and you can see in that framework that there are issues uh, of biodiversity, there are issues of health. Uh, so 
it's a whole range, uh, as you can see on the next slide there, uh, that I've painted it red because it really tells you that it's, it's, it's a serious problem there, but we can uh, deal with that problem and be able to turn it into green if we have appropriate uh, research that we carry out. But to do that, we really need to work together as a team. So we have a multitude of uh, stakeholders, but most important, I think that it is the communities uh, that we have to work with. And in this particular project, I'm also working with parliamentarians in that area. All right, so I have mentioned about the different communities that we're working in California, but for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to deep dive into San Diego. So I had mentioned yesterday in the conversation about how there are certain communities um, in San Diego where children are suffering high asthma or being diagnosed with severe asthma. In these same communities, um, these are the same communities that were redlined, where banks intentionally did not give out loans, and these were the same communities where freeways were located. So when we talk about living systems, when we talk about the ecosystem, so what you see in these communities, you see industry, uh, freeways, it's just super dense. Um, and so what the community members are doing in San Diego, they're talking about having open space. And how can you talk about open space when you're just so developed that there's not much you can do? And also too, we have short housing needs that we need to meet. So um, the moms that are in the San Diego team, they've actually developed an herb garden next to a freeway. Uh, there is a free, uh, one of our leaders uh, lives uh, by a different freeway and they, they keep talking about expanding it, but there's an, actually an area where there's trees and she actually wants to do an art um, to have murals there connecting it to the Chicano community um, and also to do also native herb plants. And so this vision is showing of how, yes, we have this, this exists, but the moms are gonna design on how we can utilize the area that can benefit our children. And at the same time, talk about policies of saying, you know, stop the expansion of freeways and we want mass transit. We need mass transit. It's been way too long. But these are some other uh, visionary ideas that our current policymakers or people that sit on the transportation agency are not thinking of. And so we really want to get back to our roots. Uh, we really want to uh, enjoy the open space because also these areas that are red line, also these areas that have freeways were park poor. So there's deficiency in parks in our neighborhoods. So we want to give that chance to our children. And so that what we hope to see is that we have a connection to a green space, that we have a connection to art, that we have a connection to culture, and that we really can have a thriving uh, neighborhoods that were once neglected for so many years. Thanks, that can actually go back oh, to Rachel. Rachel. <clears throat> so the important, one of the important themes you're seeing here is that this idea of living systems is something sometimes we have to, we have to land it in the particular place that we're talking about. And there's a lot of listening to and learning to do about the particular relationships with particular communities. Um, so it's one of the challenges as you're doing this kind of bottom up type work that sometimes your assumptions as a top down researcher might be different. Um, or, the, or the skill sets that you're bringing might be different to what the actual the, the community needs are. Um, so those are uh, themes. Um, this is a place where I did a lot of my foundational learning um, as, a, um, as a PhD student. It's the Tyree River catchment. And these next two slides, um, as Rachel introduced, uh, that we have a commonality in the sense that we're both uh, the living system that we use to structure the unit of analysis, the, the big picture unit of analysis that we use to structure the, the understanding of the social and ecological determinants of health is a watershed. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A watershed is an ecologically coherent unit. Um, it's a land and water system. It's the whole drainage basin. It's not just the water, the H2O, fly, flying through the tight pipes. It's the, it's the whole system. Um, it's the whole living system flowing away. Um, so the point about watersheds is uh, matters of flow um, and that the, um, in this particular system, we're dealing with the nuances in the Tyree, we're dealing with the nuances of agricultural intensification. 
Um, and so in, the, in those intricate scroll planes that we see in the top left, uh, we're dealing with issues of, un, of extremely active dairy intensification, which is influenced by a planetary scale commodity market driving dairy products. Dairying doesn't sound that aggressive to many people that haven't seen how severely a, an intensive dairy, um, dairy intensification can impact these kinds of systems and what it does for water quality. The issues of riparian margins, riparian margins being one of the places where life happens in river systems, the trees, the habitat for those other species that we were referring to. And when you degrade uh, riparian margins, not only are you degrading the trees that may be contributing, uh, maybe an asset for climate change um, and CO2 emissions, but you're also creating these direct pathways of flows of uh, connections between cattle and feces and rivers and downstream impacts for health and well-being. And water quality in New Zealand, uh, New Zealand has a reputation for being an incredibly clean and green country. It has got gone through a massive water quality crisis in the, in the couple of decades since I've been doing this PhD research because of the fact that we've missed the opportunity to take some of the interventions. So water quality, where we wanted to have swimmable rivers, what some of the aspirations in New Zealand now are to have wadeable rivers. Um, these are pretty dramatic shifts and they're to do with when we're allowing the drivers of, of our land use decisions. So this is what we're deciding to do on landscapes, who's involved with those processes and how they flow through. Um, and so, what you can hear is that when you, um, through some of my conversation, is that um, I'm, I, I tend to work with people that study the details, the ecologists who study the details of the living system, um, or the people that are restoring a particular fe fish species, or the people that are understanding the role of riparian margins in agricultural landscapes. But my, what I bring to the work is a, is a, is a uh, mostly a social science angle about who knows what, who, who talks to who, how are we connecting to understand where there might be room to move for intervention and change in this system. And so that's been applied in the Nachaco. Um, the Nachaco is one of the watersheds in the same ECHO project that I mentioned earlier, the Environment Community Health Observatory Network. Um, a lot of our, the partners that we work with across Canada and internationally are focusing on watershed scale efforts. And this is an example of a watershed scale effort where one of the species that's driving concern in the system is, the, is a rare Nachaco white sturgeon that has been impacted from a hydroelectric dam. Um, the, a, a, a very uh, tragic story of, and with massive impacts on indigenous peoples of creating a hydro dam at a time when it completely displaced people. These are relatively recent in Canadian history. And so those large social and ecological impacts in the 50s are still playing out with an impact on a species that um, may cease to exist in the coming years and is also being influenced by mining and oil and gas and pipelines and agricultural intensification and deforestation all in the same catchment and so by working in a catchment with the different groups that are understanding these issues we're trying to get a bigger picture um, and as I mentioned earlier just to drive it home the um, one of the biggest motivations that's increasing a real push in this work towards citizen science and particularly school-based citizen science is a very transformative um, in, uh, ed school district, which has a 30% indigenous population in this part of the world, um, in this particular school district, 14 First Nations that it needs to work with. And it's a school district that has an attitude that what's good for all Aboriginal kids is good for all kids. And that involves experiential, hands-on, getting kids outside, learning about science, segueing into science, technology, and engineering careers, getting excited, holding decision makers account. So we've got a project that's connecting students, communities, and waterways. And it's that three-way connection with the communities, the living systems, and health that really seems to be the transformative piece there. If you're just coming from a social justice angle in communities where their living systems are degrading and you're only attending to the social justice issues, you're missing a piece. But often if we're only attending to the ecological or environmental story and we're not attending to the historical grievances of indigenous peoples and social injustices, we're missing the point. So that is the momentum that, and then our challenge as researchers is to develop research protocols that can work with what the communities are wanting to ask and the partners that we're working with are wanting to ask. And if they're undertaking interventions, figuring out how to undertake the complex evaluations that might be needed to help us figure out what we need to learn from what's occurring. So it's a very different way of doing work. 
Um, and I think you've heard what we wanted to do now for, we've got, we're going to have another round with our panelists, but we really wanted you to have these two rounds as a taster and then to open it up just briefly for, for sort of 10 minutes of questions before we, we come around to have um, some closing remarks from our group. Um, so we've, we really wanted you to see this diversity. I want to go back to this important um, image, um, which is that we're, we're holding the whole planet in our imagination right now, but we're really zooming in uh, into particular places and nuances. And I wonder if people have questions for, for any of our panelists, um, especially since they were given such agonizingly short time. <laughs> Great, I've got a question over here and, and then Chris, yeah, hi. I'm just wondering how you think you're going to get this experience to Oh, that's a nice question, interesting. Um, does anyone want to start? Moses? Oh, yeah. Okay, it was uh, actually going to come on my last slide, but I can talk about it. So um, essentially uh, what we are doing ourselves in South Africa is that um, in every community that I work in, we've set up what we call community advisor board, uh, but some people want to call them community advisor structures. So these are our boundary partners. Uh, we've trained them in uh, health research uh, and they understand what we're trying to do. Uh, but then on the citizen science in that community, instead of bringing people three uh, children 300 kilometers away from Deben uh, to go to our community. We identify children that meet uh, a certain level of education, which in South Africa would be metric, just secondary education. And then we train them. Uh, and, and so they are actually collecting data even when we are not there because we have uh, set up uh, an electronic platform after training them. As they collect the data, I can actually see it in my office on my computer. And if they see a snail that they cannot identify, they can take a picture and send it to me. So it's very cost effective uh, and uh, very empowering to the community. Mm -hmm. um, um, for me, maybe it's a bit different. Um, I think the very most important to um, get in people's heart and people's minds is the sense of ownership you know and with the, my communities um, especially with the youth uh, so I conduct a lot of screenings uh, through films and videos because I know our, our communities now have been exposed so much to all this technology so I make the screenings and we show the films and videos talking about the issues and then we have discussion and then after the discussion we talk about uh, what need to be done and how everyone can involve. So that's a process actually, but then, you know, like not only the youth, but also the leaders of the communities, even the villagers, like fathers, mothers, they start to think, huh, this is what we need to do. Because for our communities, we have been so tired to be the, the object of the project, you know, like, like it has been a long time that indigenous community always becoming the content in their own story, but we want to make our own story. So this, these conversations and this dialogue and discussions that I always bring in the discussions and it creates a um, social movement. So the awareness and self-empowerment, self-discovering, which then turn the ideas into the action. So everyone sign in because they feel like, ah, oh, this is something that I need to do, I have to do, and yes, this is the right thing that I need to do. So if could just build up on that. Um, so similar to what, what she said, we, um, one of the things in the Fijian cultural system is that the existing um, dialogues, meetings, where they, where they come and talk about real issues, like issues in the community. And, but obviously there's a gap. It doesn't get to the leaders, or if it does get, it's mellowed down or probably not heard. So what's been happening is just that, that empowering moment and um, the Itoke, like the indigenous people are getting a lot more powerful and uh, they're trying to voice their opinions out. And with this uh, quarry, if you remember, it shared about, um, they, uh, they've been given a stop order notice, yeah. but, they, but they're still going on. So with this results, we're, we're definitely going to empower them because definitely this goes back to them. And they've been like, uh, like they just, they've welcomed us into the communities. Like we need this because we need this information to tell the country that we need to stop this. It's affecting us. 
So that's been so instrumental and just the whole process of empowering them. Yeah. Yes, so I want to answer that question as well. So uh, for us, what I didn't mention is that um, our moms have been advocating for a community garden and um, the city has been pushing back because they want to do, they want to develop to make money. And so for us, what we did that was really important first was that we surveyed um, 100 of our neighbors and we got the survey and all the results were overwhelming, like 97% said they wanted a community garden. And so, but we had a second. So after the survey, we did a workshop and a very detailed workshop how should the community garden look like? And it reflected a lot back because a lot of the community members are from Mexico. And so a lot of it reflected uh, just fruits and vegetables from back in Mexico. And so this was crucial to not just have, I mean, I just mentioned we have all this data to show we have, you know, no open space in our, you know, in our areas, but also to what it meant to the community, that they were supporting this and that they were part of the design. So for us, it's very important doing the surveys, it's very important to do the workshops, and it's very important that we we also teach the community members these mapping tools, like the Calavirus screen, because it gets very technical, but they see it, and then they have those conversations with not just elected officials, but staffers that are in the planning department. <clears throat> So the, um, I think what's neat about these examples is that the notion of citizen science also sort of stands, extends into citizen inquiry and honouring citizen and community knowledge and, and what are the techniques we have to, to, to do that. Um, so uh, the, um, the ECHO Network, Environment Community Health Observatory Network, we have a little catchphrase um, that we talk about, which is taking notice for action. Um, and the, the purpose of the ECHO Network is to try to understand <clears throat> and, un, and respond to the, and to, um, to understand the cumulative, <clears throat> excuse me, cumulative impacts of resource extraction and development, um, particularly in northern rural and remote communities, um, and to be, work on intersectoral action. Um, and so this taking notice for action is requiring us to take notice in an integrative way and then to figure out how to try to be doing that uh, um, to moving that knowledge into action, which is not easy. And the, um, the words that inspired taking notice for action actually come from a, the UK's uh, economics, uh, New Economics Foundation, Five Ways of Wellbeing, um, because trying to understand the research process and citizen science is part of a, of a wider process of learning and engagement and exchange. So the five ways of wellbeing are, um, they're easy to find. Um, they are to take notice. <laughs> these, these are things to do as persons, not just as teams of researchers. Take notice, connect, keep learning, share and I've forgotten the fifth one I had them all there but the, the they're really kind of core ideas and what we try to do in our echo network team is to is to use research as a pathway into those core things that we need to do as human beings and also to make knowledge to encourage knowledge to flow um, and so the, the importance here with the citizen science piece um, which is your, the core of your question the citizen science work that we're doing with the school districts, for example, in that particular watershed is being driven by um, want the school district wanting to connect these students with the living, with the, uh, with the outdoor, they want them to be engaged stewards and they want them to understand and, and see themselves as active members of their community. And they also want them to become engaged decision makers, which is a pretty big agenda for a school district. But through doing that, getting them to be informed stewards, they, we're trying to work really hard on a useful, uh, we, you know, we've got to do, there's a, quite a lot of citizen science work we're doing to get the best, we're adapting the Pacific Stream Keepers um, program to be relevant to these indigenous and, and non-indigenous communities. We're trying to create sharing and exchange and build ex uh, information exchange platforms where that work from the schools is actually feeding into our integrated watershed research group at the university. And like Moses, that we're trying to create these as pathways where we're all in this together. You know, no, even though the researchers have some fab fabulous geeky stuff, the students are also giving that sort of first taster and it's a gateway drug for them to not only to being scientists, but to, to wonder and to, to connecting themselves with these systems. Um, so it is, a, it is an inspiring, um, I think these, they're inspiring for all of us when we see 
those voices, not just in science ways, but voices being heard and then moving um, to places where, where they need to hear them. And then also being building up their own knowledge again, which I think is, and valuing that knowledge build up. I had Chris and Sam, and then we're going to do our final lap. Um, I don't think we're going to have uh, more time. Chris, I'll hand over to you. Uh, Chris Busey, University of British Columbia. I just want to start by commending you all for all of your local work. It's really, really inspiring to see these connections be drawn between the idea of place connectedness on one hand and justice issues on the other. So thanks for that. Um, I wanted to pick up on something Margot said, the, the idea of all of our relations. And of course, we know all of our relations extend beyond the local context. They, they connect across time and space to, to fundamentally different contexts. So one of the challenges in my mind of talking about planetary health challenges that we know that they manifest locally. All of those impacts are felt locally. The responses are principally driven locally. So I'm just curious about your thoughts and reflections from the panelists. How do you think about the local actions that you're taking in terms of how they speak to global or planetary health justice? It's a big question. Well, Chris, you've possibly- uh, The last possibly question. Pre uh, <laughs> pre <laughs> preempted our last question. Um, uh, what I think I might do, because we are going to run out of time, that is in some ways the question that we wanted yeah. people to finish with. Um, and, it's, and Chris has actually helped yeah. us take a wee bit of a deeper dive on that question. Do you mind if I let it, that be for our closing remarks? Um, and I'll just, Sam, you had a question. Did you want to? Well, yeah, so um, I apologize if I came in a little late, so you may have talked about this, but um, you know, we, Marshall Gans talks about knowledge problems and power problems, and I'm hearing a mix of both of them in the comments you've all made. There's some things that we need to understand better, but there's a lot that you're describing really as power problems, the huge Darien tree that's polluting the river, or you know, the quarry um, deforestation. And I guess I'd love to learn a little bit more about, you talked um, about empowering you know, local communities about the how part of that, how do you address this power balance and mm. how do you um, create collective action and, and power in response to special interests where we already know what the problem is? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, why so, don't we take a couple of us? We may not all have to answer that question, but I imagine there might be a few. In that context, for example, in terms of empowering, with, with the Fijian culture and the context that I'm talking about, just recently we've uh, developed a ministry of its own on indigenous people. And that in itself is starting to empower people to speak out. So um, that is one of the things that's really strengthened it. But obviously there is um, um, on a need for an ongoing process of empowering them to speak out a lot more because mm -hmm. within the Fijian culture, I'm not sure if it's the same across with developing countries, we tend to take on a lot more rather than speak out that much. And that we need people to start voicing their opinions, their, you know, what they would like to see happen. And uh, one of the ways it's happening is we're now making the communities themselves be a voice in a multi-sectorial, you know, no, a committee, a meeting, or in a, um, like a gathering as such, where we get the people to be the voice of that either, um, either community or a place, whatever it may be. So that's that's commonly happening now, and um, obviously as we go, that strengthens. And another example I'd say is, for example, within the water systems, we've got now in Fiji. This um, that, that we we every community should have a uh, water drinking community, a water drinking and sanitation community committee, and uh, obviously communities don't know how to set this up. They don't know what goes into that in terms of reference. So what what do we do in that? So this is where we've been coming in, and as part of our ongoing interventions, we're going to be empowering them and strengthening. Things like and guiding them through this process and once they see it obviously we can gradually replicate it right across the country so that's a, one example I can share. so very quickly uh, in my communities we rely on a very strong uh, community engagement and involvement strategy so for all our projects uh, when we get there we initially we inform them of our projects we consult them uh, in, in big meetings 
uh, and then we involve them in our project. And ultimately, we believe that uh, as we go on the journey, we empower them. Uh, now, currently, I actually have got a PhD study, a student who is looking at those aspects to just see if we are doing what we are supposed to be doing, because then they ask us, what are you doing to empower the communities? And then she goes to the community and asks them, uh, are you, do you feel empowered? So we have set certain indicators because many people want to use the word empower when you're actually not empowering them. But our community advisory board is actually doing exactly that uh, because we've given them adequate information, we've given them a budget of our project, they can control us. <laughs> Thumbs up from Emanuela. Um, Rita, is your question burning or could you ask it later? It's a statement. Okay, sure. Do you want to mark yeah. it? <laughs> Um, hi, so my name is Rita. I'm from London and I'm on the side an organizer with a protest group called Extinction Rebellion, which is um, a nonviolent direct action group uh, fighting for um, eco ecological and climate justice. And it's just a call out to say that in October in the UK, we have a two week um, protest site that's going to be happening and I'm running the global justice site. And I I'd love to invite you all to speak via video if that's okay um, and also opening up the invitation to any researchers in the room as well we're going to be having on that site um, a health hub which is going to be talking about planetary health and so really trying to bring in academics people on the ground um, to place pressure on the UK government and hopefully that will um, move into broader spheres so please come and talk to me if you're interested Indeed. <laughs> uh, so we wanted that we had three rounds of questions that we wanted our panelists to do. We've done two of them. And the third question was um, related to the connections to planetary health. But we wanted to ask our panelists to think about their what questions or challenges they may have in terms of um, or a message to as we struggle with what Chris articulated of moving from the deeply local to be thinking about things at a planetary scale as we scale up and we're thinking about the planetary health community, what messages might we have to make sure that we don't um, lose that local resonance in our, when we're thinking from the local right up to the planetary? And also how to, to make sure that this kind of work is valued, not just as a secondary element of the work, but as deeply embedded within how we do the work, not just what we're studying. So um, Chris, uh, thanks for digging that deeper into the sort of the challenges of doing that. So we'll, we'll do the round again. Rachel, we'll start with you and we're just really a closing remarks from, from all of the, across the panel. Sweet, thanks. Yeah, I mean, you were so right in saying that, you know, these communities are the core of planetary health. Give you a typical example with all that's happening. We've, I mean, in Fiji, we've got three major things happening. Communicable disease is a crisis, NCD is a crisis, climate change is a crisis in the Pacific. And if you look at them all, they're all interrelated. And if you look at just one community, which I've been sharing about water systems, if you don't have what uh, food that's beside the or in the river, you'll definitely go and resource yourself to something else. And what's that? That's probably processed foods. And what does that lead to? NCDs, of course. Because obviously they do not have the money to buy the expensive things which get into the country, like probably really nice veggies or something, unless they have good agricultural land. But obviously, as you're seeing, this is being affected as well. So that process that happens. And with that, the most important, one of the challenging things I've seen in this is that we need to start thinking, when we're thinking of change, in that living system. We need to make sure it's a holistically multi-sectorial approach to things. We need to keep the communities at the heart of it all. We need to make sure that if we're doing anything to the living system that surrounds us, it has to be an involvement of everybody, not just, okay, yeah, I'm the landowner, I agree to this, and I'm gonna make that change. It's not about that. Every person's voice should matter in this context. And not just every person's voice, but even to the point that we need government organizations or if it be private in your country, we need to talk to each other. We need a multi-sectoral approach where we come to a round table discussions like, we wanna do this, how can we best do it? 
There are probably other ways of doing it without affecting the living systems around us, but we've got to work that out. We've got to talk, we've got to dialogue, we've got to really communicate. And I think that's pretty much key to getting moving things forward. That's actually represent my talk as well. <laughs> yeah, in the past, my ancestors fought the enemies by, by using spear and swords. Yeah. But now we face the enemies that cannot be divided by swords and spares anymore. So here, I believe the technology and all this knowledge from all different persons and backgrounds are very important and very crucial. And everyone has a very important role to play. And I just want to say uh, in terms of the connections of, of all these things uh, with the pl uh, planetary health, you know, in global context, don't make the community only as the object. Because, yeah, it will go nowhere. Yeah, they are the subject. They are the heart. They are the core, and they are the ones at the front line. They are the ones that are at the front line. And I want you to know, the indigenous communities, the local communities, are not the hopeless and helpless. They are powerful. Yeah. So we need to hold their hands and work together and support what becoming the indigenous initiatives. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, we we work on, uh, on the nexus of you know the environment, the socio-ecological environment, the economy, um, and uh, to do that, we uphold six principles in the research that I do uh, using the eco health approach, um, and uh, I won't go into detail in all of them, but I want to mention, for instance, transdisciplinarity. Um, is often confused with multidisciplinarity and other things. So in my view and what we practice is that transdisciplinarity, if you don't have uh, non-academics in that group, then it's not transdisciplinarity. So we will embrace NGOs, we'll embrace common people uh, to do our work and we walk the journey together and that's very important. Now the, the, the involvement and participation of stakeholders is also very key at all different levels. It must be, the pathway to impact must be very clear. What is the role of each person on that journey? Uh, and we can never achieve this if we don't uphold the principles of gender and social equity. Because I work uh, from a public health perspective uh, in, in, in diseases, people are affected differently. Even when uh, there's a challenge of water, uh, they are also affected differently. So, but one other key thing is about how do we then move from just having knowledge to action? So we, we have actually done this in my group by uh, bringing in people that people never thought I could work with. And uh, I have one postdoctoral fellow who has got three degrees, all of them in English and music. And his role is actually to bring edutainment uh, to the platform. And he has come up with a brilliant idea that at the end of this year, we're going to identify local role models uh, and, and reward them. Uh, and we have a ceremony where we actually say, these are the change makers in that community. So I'll leave it here. Uh, we also want to uphold the sustainability. Mm -mm. So for us, the moms, we take a lesson learning from the native people in our, in our area, which is, being stewards of the land, being stewards to protect the earth. And so what that means for us is that we highlight the problem areas. I already mentioned about the industry. I mentioned the asthma. Another thing too, we're by the bay and we don't even have access to the bay because there's ships, because they import cars from that port. So one out of eight cars that are driven in North America come in our city. So the water's contaminated. We can't even fish there. Because if we fish there and we eat it, we would be poisoned. We already had a flood. So we are a flood zone. And we already had elderly people died because we have a lot of senior housing near the bay. So for us, it's taking the lessons learned from the native people of our land, advocating to our legislators that this is important. When we talk about community plans, we're talking about when we look at the order of our house, we wouldn't put the toilet in our kitchen. 
So why are we putting industry next to our homes? And so that's how we're connected to the planetary health. We're protecting and respecting it. And we're going to continue to do that. So uh, we're aware we've got you a couple of minutes over, um, but just as, an, as a wrap up idea, um, I wanted to bring forth this kind of scribble that uh, is an exercise in some ways that we can all do. Um, and this was uh, a way that we conceived of the uh, Mautiki Tai, uh, which means from the ridge to the ocean. It was a gathering of indigenous researchers and their allies in Aotearoa in April this year was convened with the EcoHealth International of Oceania chapter. And the point about this diagram and by the words and the holding of the planet in our imagination is that we can move from the local and find the connections to those, the next scale up. In this case, it was, we were up on a, a viewpoint looking out of over the Hauraki Gulf. And then we could cast our gaze, gaze up to the Pacific Ocean and we could actually imagine, we could see when we got out on the water on this trip, we could see the curve of the planet. And we could imagine that these flows and connections that we were talking about are all active. And we can do this anywhere. We can do this right here. We can do this where we're thinking about being in Stanford, but we're also thinking about the San Francisco Bay Area and how is what I've done here connected to that? And then we can also recognize we're in this magical region of the Pacific West Coast and we can extend our gaze up to the Pacific Ocean and my and Māori, the uh, Moana Nui Akiwa, we can be, see the connections and recognize the, the ocean, ocean flows and issues that we heard about um, this morning and, and at other times, and then we can come up to our planetary home. One of the key ideas here that is so important, and I know that it's something people understand, but we have to work hard at it, is that these are not new ideas. These are some of the oldest ideas about our deep connectedness. And that, um, and that whilst there is such a merit in framing and scaling up and thinking about planetary and, and being putting health into that planetary context, um, we joke about the fact that there's got to be a P, there's the personal health, there's the public health, the population health, and the planetary health. Um, <laughs> but, the, but that we also have a lot of other traditions, um, whether it is the principles that um, Moses were talking about, that EcoHealth as a community has been working with, those are not new ideas either. EcoHealth didn't come up with them. They just acknowledged and respected and brought together a set of patterns of things we have to pay attention to. So one of our challenges is whether it's from the diet communities that we've been hearing about or the indigenous communities in other parts of the world um, or the learning that people in San Diego are doing with indigenous communities, that that's a very big part of the work, but so are other traditions of scholarship to be generous as we forge this new terrain um, and also to figure out how we can convene in good ways. And so um, as we've been doing here, we really wanted to mention, uh, we may get a chance for Moses to mention this later, but we are going to be continuing these conversations about communities and justice and living systems and more um, in Durban in June in 2020. Um, and we're excited about the fact that um, there's connections with the regional conversations that are already happening in the planetary health community. Um, and EcoHealth has biennial conferences, which we also try to land in different regions of the world. And there's such um, really exciting opportunities to cross fertilize and to keep learning, um, particularly about the kinds of stories that we've heard about today. Um, so thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you to these fabulous panelists who are so inspiring um, and have, I, I know we've got an important lunch to get to, to hear the Indigenous speakers. Thank you.